Okay, good morning everyone. Um, let's, uh, let's get started. We uh, recall last class um, we were looking at this example of uh, Newton's method. So this is back in handout 8A from the prior class if you want to get that. And uh, there was space there in that handout to continue on that example. I'd asked you to try it out at home and finish it up potentially. If anyone needs an 8A handout, there's some, or, uh, some spares here at the front. So just uh, let's perhaps as context recall what we're aiming to do here. Um, I will draw you the single dimension equivalent. Okay, so in a single variable case, we're trying to apply Newton's method here. And what this essentially does is it approximates the function with the quadratic. So in a single variable case, you could conceive this as having a single variable x, some function f of x here in black. And we're trying to locate that minimum there, x star. And what we're doing is we're starting at some starting point. Uh, let's put it out over here, x0. And what we're doing is essentially fitting a quadratic to this curve. So this black line isn't a quadratic. We're approximating it with one. So we're fitting a quadratic function here, p of x. And what we're going to set then is find that minimum of the quadratic, and that's going to be my x1 for the next iteration. Then I move to x1, and at x1 I run and fit another quadratic to this, so this quadratic this time might be something like that. So this is my second iteration. I fit a, a polynomial that approximates that function. I find the minimum of that polynomial, and that becomes x2. So it, there's this delta x then that's happened. We've moved from x0 to x1, x1 to x2, and we'll approach that by the successive polynomial approximation. So that's in one dimension, and we're doing this now in two dimensions. So here's Newton's method for you. Last class, you'd written that function f. You had found the first derivative, as well as the second derivative matrix, the Hessian. Okay, so sub that in, and I'd like you to finish up steps three, four, and five. So last class we ended up at the gradient, calculating the gradient, so we're moving on from that point into step three. So for those of you that did do this at home, um, I had asked you to, to try it out at home. If you've done this already, feel free to move on to handout 8B. There's another question that you can work on so long.
Okay, so this one's a very straightforward uh, problem. Um, I'm a little bit disappointed to see a lot of you just disengaged with this. I really need you to be active here in the class and making the most of the time here. Um, we're not doing this just for fun. Let's, uh, let's try and understand what's going on here. So we saw that the gradient is given here by this analytical equation last class. The Hessian, um, any answers here? Two, four, 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 four. And then two, okay, so it's a matrix of constants. Um, so th that's interesting. It's often um, a matrix of variables, but this particular Hessian is, is a constant matrix. Um, if we follow the process here, then quite simply, we've done step two, then step three is evaluate whether that gradient is already zero. Well, the gradient at our starting point is non-zero, so we're, we're not terminating just yet. So we go on to step four and solve that matrix equation. The Hessian <coughs> multiplied by delta x. So the Hessian 4, 2, 2, 2 multiplied by the change. We're going to step by an amount delta x1 and an amount of delta x2. And that's equal to the negative of the gradient evaluated at our starting point. So that's equal to minus 1 plus 1. OK, so that's two equations in two unknowns. So linear algebra, two equations in two unknowns. It's of the form ax equals b, as I pointed out last class, which we can solve very easily. That x, that variable x, is found by inverting a on the right-hand side and multiplying it by b. OK, so it's the equivalent of bringing this 2 by 2 matrix on the left-hand side over to the right-hand side. And I'll just rewrite it that way. Then delta x1, delta x2 is equal to the inverse of 4, 2, 2, 2 multiplied by minus 1 plus 1. Now that's a quick step that you can easily do. Um, perhaps one thing to recall, and this is something I, I expect you to know, that the matrix inverse for a 2 by 2 matrix, uh, let's say it's a matrix A, B, C, D, that the inverse of that matrix is equal to 1 over D times A minus B, C, and then we just flip D and A around, so D and A. Um, and then we also flip the signs of B and C. Okay, so that's uh, something that you should recall um, as a shortcut for 2 by 2 matrix inverses. So if we sub that in here, um, we're then getting an answer where that is 2 quarters in the first element minus 2 quarters in the second um, minus two quarters in the row two, column one, and then four over four. Multiply that by minus one plus one. Did most of you get this far or not yet? Okay, lots of heads shaking yes. So um, the solution to that then is minus one plus three over two. Okay, so that's telling me how much I'm going to move x1 by, delta x1, delta x2. I'm going to move x1 by minus 1, and I'm going to move x2 by 3 over 2. Okay. 
So let's just look at that here. We shouldn't just um, follow this algorithm routinely. Let's take a look and see if that makes sense. We're over here at 0, 0. Our optimum lies over there. In fact, this is a minimization. We're heading down into that valley. And it says to go minus 1 unit in x1. That makes sense. We'll drop by minus 1 unit in x1. And we'll go up by 1.5 units in x2. And in fact, if you look at that, it's minus 1 plus 3 over 2. It takes us to the optimum in a single step. Okay. So we've converged onto that optimum. Let's go back up to Newton's method here and, and just see there. Take the full Newton step by solving that equation for delta x. We've done that now. And our next iteration is going to start at x k 0, 0 our, was our original point, our starting point, plus this change. And then we go back to step 2. And step 2 says check the gradient and check the Hessian matrix. Okay. So let's, let's do that. Right, we're seeing that we've landed up the, at the optimum, but only because we've got a contour plot here on the screen. The computer doesn't have that. So how does the computer know that we've uh, we're landed up at the optimum? Well, let's go try out step two there. What's the gradient at 1, minus 1, and 3 over 2? Sub into the first derivative equation there. Zero. It's a zero. Zero. I can look because x not is zero zero. That's why it's the same thing, right? Yeah. If I'd started at a different x zero, I would have landed up at okay. Yeah. So it's additive, yeah. Okay. So that's how the computer knows that you've you're at the optimum, is because the first derivative of f at this next iteration happens to be 0. We can see it here visually from the graph, but that's how the computer would know. Or at least the computer would know that within a certain tolerance. So that's what the absolute value signs are. And notice there that that's the matrix norm. So you'd have to take a, ma a matrix um, norm of that and check that that is small. In other words, one way to do that is just to take the sum of squares of the entries in that, in that vector. Okay, so we, we're comfortable with taking absolute values on a scalar, but when that's a matrix inside there, one way to quantify that is to calculate the sum of squares of each entry. And if the sum of squares of each entry is close to zero, then we know that we're at the optimum and we can stop. Why did this converge in one iteration? Alex? Right. So the key insight that you should take away from that is if your function is already a quadratic function, you will converge in, a, in one iteration. Because you're estimating this, as Alex said, with, a sing with another quadratic function. Okay, so when we do apply Newton's method, it approximates the function with the quadratic and goes to the minimum of that quadratic function that you're approximating it with. In this case, our approximation matches the function exactly, so we should land up and expect to converge in exactly one iteration. OK, so that's, um, that's Newton's method. And based on uh, the feedback that you gave me in the last class, uh, there was some interesting points in there, and I'll touch on it later on. But one of the things that you wanted to see was a little bit more example. So let's try another case of this that's a little bit less obvious. Right, so we've got a, gr a quadratic estimated with a quadratic. Let's try something a little harder. So let's go to handout 8b. And um, we're going to try this on the question from the midterm, which you've been working on in the assignment. So you know this function very well. OK, so this is a, a good one to, to work with because we don't need to figure out what's going on. This is not a quadratic function. Um, here's our starting point. At the tip of the, the red arrow at the bottom, there's our starting point. And the red arrow I've shown here only to compare with later on. The red arrow indicates the search direction if you were just using steepest descent. 
Okay, so here we're trying to maximize. That's the first derivative direction. What we want to see now is when we apply Newton's method, where is Newton's method going to take us? Is it going to take us a little bit over to the right or a little bit over to the left? How is Newton's method different from this method that we've already learned about? So I'll give you a few minutes. Apply um, the same Newton's algorithm. I've reproduced it for you there on the top of the page. So there's Newton's method for you. You don't have to flip back. Apply Newton's method fairly routinely. Calculate the first derivatives. Calculate the second derivatives in the Hessian matrix. Apply at least one iteration of Newton's method. You don't have to do two in this class. And this is something that should hopefully take you about five to six minutes to, to do one iteration. There's space over the page for you to do your calculations. Okay, everyone get a symmetrical Hessian matrix? Yeah. yeah, okay, so I'll fill that in for you while you keep going.
Okay, so don't just copy what's on the board. They actually try to calculate them, make sure you know what's going on there. But those should be the answers that you get. So I'll give you another two, three minutes to try understand that. If you're already at that point, go, go beyond that. Invert your Hessian matrix and calculate where your first point is, x1, and draw it on, the, on this graph. Okay, and if you're working at record pace here, please go on and do the second iteration, but um, give you another minute and then I'll just go through what's here. No, it's the off diagonals that are symmetrical. Yeah. 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 Because df dx1 dx2 is the same as df dx2 dx1. Yeah. OK, so the first derivative vector is um, shown over there. The second derivative matrix, the Hessian, is given over there. Um, apologies for the awkward uh, lines there. Just for spacing, I had to compress it up. But it is a symmetrical matrix. The 1, 2, 2, 1 position um, numbers match each other. So we can then go follow the Newton's method says to evaluate the first derivative. And we get a value of 32, 100. You all did that in the midterm uh, successfully. That vector is non-zero, so we're not at the optimum. So we also then go calculate the Hessian at x naught, so sub in into this equation in the Hessian matrix and we get uh, again the symmetric matrix with fours on the off diagonals and minus 60 and minus 144 on the diagonal entries. So then our problem is down to solving 
and finding what a step is to move away from x naught. And the solution to this equation is delta x, in other words, the change in x1, the change in x2, is equal to the inverse of the Hessian multiplied by the negative of the gradient. So minus the gradient evaluated at x naught. Okay, so this is a matrix multiplication times a vector. So just to emphasize that, that's a 2 by 2 matrix multiplied by a 2 by 1 vector. Okay, so we're down to finding two things. The, the negative gradient is easy to get. That's minus 32 minus 100. The inverse Hessian, we can go use that formula uh, written up there. And uh, just give you the answer over here. For those of you that have got calculators, just verify here for me that it's um, minus 144 over, well, let's just uh, write the denominator outside here. It's 1 over 1. So that's uh, AD minus BC. And then we flip these elements around on the diagonal. And uh, minus 60. Okay, so that's the inverse Hessian multiplied by the negative gradient times 32 minus 100. Okay, and if you do that, that gets you your delta x1, delta x2. That's a vector. Your answer is a 2 by 1 vector. And its answer is, in this instance, 0 0.58 and 0 0.71. So it says you're going to move up by 0.58 units in x1 and move up by 0.71 units in x2. Or in other words, that implies that your second iteration, let's call that x1, is going to take place at 1.58 and at 3.71. Okay. So take a minute and draw that point on the, on the existing graph and see where it lies and compare it to the red arrow, which was the gradient method. The gradient method, recall, only uses first derivatives. We now have used second derivatives, so, so we should be uh, um, getting a little closer. Okay, so uh, let me just uh, show you what you should get is something like this. Okay, so there's your first point. It lands up over here if you redraw it. So it's, it's actually not quite as good as a step as um, the other one. Yeah. It does, right? So yeah, it, your, the efficacy of the first method is how far along this direction do you go? So I mean, visually, we would be somewhere over here. Six iterations. Yeah. So we're, I'm going to show you how this one converges now. Yeah. Okay. So your first step isn't quite as big as a jump as you might have expected. It, it's actually a, a relatively small change, and you land up at that point 1.58, uh, 3.71. 
So that's your first iteration. Now, if you can do this once, you can do it several times. So no need to, to try repeat it. Here's the answer for the second iteration. Feel free to uh, write that down and practice with that at home. Um, and that point then lies over there. Okay, so 3.37 is your second iteration. 3.37 and 4.36. So it's heading in, in that direction. And then if you tried this out a third time, um, it's actually heading, takes a 90 degree turn and heads towards the optimum. Okay. And if you do a few more iterations, actually it's, it's interesting. I'll post the MATLAB code for this on the course website. Um, the fourth op iteration actually overshoots the optimum. Okay, so here it is. Um, I'll just show it to you, but you and post this code for you to copy and paste. So we've gone from zero to one to two to three, and then four we actually overshoot, and then five, six, and we come back towards the optimum. Yes, Mark. Uh, Joseph said he did his in six. It would also depend on your line search algorithm. Yeah. So that's a little lower. Uh, but just to, just to clarify, the reason uh, it went from point one to point two, the reason it went so far that way is because the quadratic lines are just Right. So it's it depends on the opt the quadratic function that it's fitting. So here it's fitting a quadratic, at point one it's using the slope and the second derivative information to fit a quadratic which would have contours like that with the optimum in the center there with x1. That's the optimum of the quadratic fit at that location. So okay. So then when you're at x1 you fit a second quadratic function and that quadratic function that you fit at x1 has its optimum at x2. At x2, you fit another quadratic function which, whose optimum is at x3. So you're, you're, you're using local polynomial approximations to move yourself to the next step. Okay? The difference with the first order method is the first order method uses only first derivative information. So it can't fit a polynomial. It simply gives you a direction to go in, and it's up to you to do a line search to see how far along that direction to go. Okay? So that's that's crucial, right? Because this, the Newton's method, we have to ask ourselves, and what Mark was asking is, it like, which one has fewer iterations than, than, uh, than the other? The Newton's method will most times, guarantee, not, we can't guarantee it, but most times the evidence in the optimization uh, community is that Newton's method will converge extremely rapidly with very few iterations. But at what cost? Okay, so let's go, uh, if you look back at handout 8A, there were some bullet points for you to fill in. What's the cost of Newton's method? Does it matter at the degree of the polynomial? Like obviously, you know, if it's a quadratic, then it'll find the optimum right away, but since this was like four fits or whatever. No, it fits, a, it fits a quadratic surface to whatever function. Yeah. So we're always only fitting a quadratic. Oh, but I'm sorry, I mean, if our, um, In one step, yes. Will it, will Newton's method work better for other degrees? Yeah, so as long as the function is smooth and can calculate the first and second derivatives, then you can fit a quadratic to approximate that function. So it depends on the quality of that quadratic approximation to the original function. Okay, so let's think. What, what does Newton's method require over and above the steepest ascent and steepest descent method? It's that matrix of second derivatives, right? And what else did you notice in that calculation that you needed? Inverse. To find an inverse. OK, so those are two expensive operations. Finding the inverse of a matrix doesn't come cheaply on computer software. Also, how big is your Hessian matrix? If you've got n search variables, how many elements in your Hessian matrix do you have to go calculate
the correct, it's a, there's a lot of good answers and guesses. That's great. N squared, it's N um, minus 1 over 2. Okay, that's the exact number of terms in your Hessian matrix. And sorry, that's a mistake. It's N plus 1. Okay, so your Hessian matrix has N, N plus 1 over 2. So let's try this out. If n is equal to 2, you get 2 plus 3 is 6 divided by 2. You've got three terms in your Hessian. That's correct. You've got two diagonals and one off diagonal. Okay, and then you can copy and paste it over. Right? You never have to repeat that. So if n is equal to 3, a 3 by 3 system, 3, plus, uh, 3 times 4 is 12 over 2. You've got 6. Okay, so if we look back at this, that matrix, you've got three entries on the diagonals and then three on the off diagonals and you can copy and paste it over. Okay, so six. So Hessian for, let's say it's 100, 100 by 100 search variables, that's a, a large matrix you have to calculate. Firstly, you have to find those derivatives. Many of them will be zero, but you still have to calculate it and prove that it's zero. Then you have to go evaluate it and then you have to go take the inverse and it might not be possible to take the inverse of that matrix. It might be poorly conditioned. Okay, so those are expensive operations. So we have to s make sure that it has some value to use Newton's method. Let's, uh, let's go explore that a little bit more, though. Um, here in the notes, so moving on to page 3, I'll, um, I'll go midway to the page, and then I'll come back to the, f the top half of page 3. The top of page three is standalone, so the, the middle half is talks about the equivalences that we've done here. Let's take a look. In the past few classes, we've looked at single variable and multivariable. And in the single variable case, we looked at the gradient method, and we've already looked at the gradient equivalent in two dimensions. Right? So that was where you'll recall we said the gradient method in two dimensions uses a step size delta x is equal to the gradient of f of x. And then we put a plus or minus here, depending on whether we're maximizing or minimizing. So we've looked at the multidimensional equivalent of the first derivative method. We've looked at the multidimensional version of Newton's method. That's what we've just covered. And I'm going to cover in a minute, this is the top half of page 3 that I've skipped over, but I'll come back to it, whether the, first, the second derivatives are positive or negative. Okay. The one thing we've not done is looked at the quasi-Newton's method. We looked at the quasi-Newton's method. Remember, what that means is where we, instead of using the actual derivative, we use f of x with a finite difference method. We said f of x plus h minus f of x over h. So we approximate the first derivative. And we looked at the, the approximation of the second derivative as well. Well, can we do that in, in multi-dimensions? Yes, we can. It's really messy. I don't want to even show the math equations up here for you. You're very welcome to click on that link, and it takes you to an article that shows you how that works. But our purpose isn't to really understand the multi-dimensional equivalent, other than to recognize that it behaves in the same way as the single dimension case. Now, let's just take a look at the net result of that. Remember, in this quasi-Newton's method for a single variable, you're approximating derivatives. So we do that here in the multidimensional case. We say, if we wanted to do Newton's method in multiple dimensions, that matrix H is expensive to find, it's expensive to store in memory, it's expensive to invert. So let's skip all of those. Let's simply create an approximation of this H matrix and call it D. Okay. So D is simply an approximate inverse of the Hessian. Notice that it's the approximation of the inverse. So we don't have to, we're not going to try and approximate the Hessian and then still invert D. We're actually just going to straight away go right to our end goal and approximate the inverse Hessian. And when we do that, we will update that approximation with every iteration. As we get closer and closer to the optimum, eventually DK will approach what the Hessian would have been if we had calculated it manually. And the way 
And this is where the messy math is, which you can go look on that link, is you can go see how dk is changed from iteration to iteration. The important thing is it has got a superscript k indicating that it's not constant. It's, it's being updated every iteration. And by your final iteration, it should be a close match to the true Hessian. Okay, so that's what all this text here is saying for you. Now, where do we start? We have to start with some initial D matrix. Right? And the matrix of zeros isn't going to work. What we start actually with is the identity matrix. And if you look at these formula as written here, this shows us that starting with the identity matrix actually indicates you're starting off with steepest descent. Look back at this uh, formula I had here for a, a minute ago. I'll just rewrite it up here. In, we looked at earlier that delta x is equal to the negative of the first derivative of, of f. Okay, that's if you're trying to minimize. And that's exactly what, what's written there if you sub in the identity matrix for your deflection matrix. So when you start off these algorithms, BFGS is the most common method. That's why I want to discuss this, actually. The most important thing that you take away from this is that this BFGS isn't a surprising acronym to you. It's widely, widely used in nonlinear optimization. And what it simply does is it starts off with the identity matrix. In other words, we start off with the steepest descent. And as we approach the optimum, we're moving to essentially Newton's method. And the nice thing about those updates is the updates are done only using first derivative information. We don't have to actually compute second derivatives at all. OK, so that's the extent we will go to in this course because it's, it's messy and it's unnecessary to see the mathematical detail. We don't learn too much from it. And we let GAMS and the solvers in GAMS take care of that detail for us. So that's the quasi-Newton's method. And when we try to use it on a multi-dimensional function, we'll, we'll always use a solver to do this work for us. The deflection matrix is just another name? The deflection matrix is the name of this matrix, which is updated on every iteration. And the reason for deflection is because it, it deflects the point to a new location on every iteration. Okay. Now, this approach is lies somewhere between steepest descent and Newton's method, right? It's not as fast as Newton's method, but it, it certainly converges um, quickly. It has what is typically called super linear convergence. So it's beyond linear, but less than quadratic convergence. So super linear convergence, and it's, it's the more successful of the quasi-Newton methods. There's other quasi-Newton methods out there, but BFGS is the one that's most commonly used named after the four people that uh, derived and invented it. OK, so the last point um, I want to talk a bit about is up here is on another terminology that you will see in multi, uh, multivariable optimization. And that's the nature of the Hessian matrix. And it's positive definite or positive, uh, uh, positive definite or negative definite. So the reason why that, that's an issue is, remember back in the single dimension case, when we optimize, we're actually solving f dash of x equals to 0. Okay. So set the first derivative equal to 0. But that doesn't mean that you're at a maximum if you're maximizing. You could be at a local minimum, even if you're trying to maximize, because all that the solver is doing is it's trying to hunt for a point where the first derivative is 0. So it's not guaranteed to be a max or a min. The way we check that is by checking the second derivatives. And we had this discussion last class where we said, let's look back at the single variable case. And if we recognize that that term goes away at the optimum, then we're essentially examining that last quadratic approximation. Now let's go see what I've done here in, below. I've taken that quadratic term. And I've written it out in a way that's a little bit unusual. I've taken it, the x minus xk. I've taken one of it to the front, and I've left the one of it at the back. And I've left the second derivative in the middle. So it has the form, if you subbed in d, d for delta, times s for the second derivative, times d, dsd. So it has that, that format. And remember we said 
that all we're interested in is whether that s is positive or negative. d squared is always going to be positive, so we can ignore that, but s is what tells us whether we're at a local minimum or a local maximum. If s is negative, we're at a local max. If s is positive, we're at a local minimum. That's in the single dimension case. Now, is there an equivalent in the multivariable case? That there is. And again, at the multivariable case, this term goes away at the optimum. And then we're only focused on this Hessian matrix. So notice the structure is the same, a d times s times a d. Here's your delta times a matrix of second derivatives times a delta. So similar structure, dsd. But in the multidimensional case, our S, our matrix of second derivatives, is a matrix. It's not a single, single value like in the univariate case. So we're going to have to tell something about the H matrix to tell us whether we're at a local max or a local min. And what that is, is whether the matrix H is positive or negative definite. Again, this is a, a linear algebra term you may or may not recall from your second year courses. I'm not sure if it was even covered. So let's just quickly look at it here and, and see that it actually does work. You can tell if a matrix is positive definite in the following way. You put it into MATLAB, you take the eigenvalues of it, and if all the eigenvalues are positive, it's a positive definite matrix. Okay. The reason is because the definition for positive definite relies on a long derivation related to eigenvalues of the matrix. But the quick way we would do it is to simply use MATLAB to calculate those eigenvalues for us. So if all my eigenvalues are positive, the matrix is called positive definite. And then we know that, let's cross-reference here, a positive definite matrix implies that we're at a local minimum. Okay, so that's a very easy check. Check the eigenvalues. Are they positive? If so, we're at a local minimum. So if we go back to this example we were looking at previously at the start of this class, that was a minimization problem. Your Hessian matrix was, uh, here's a mistake in here. I just realized it's not 4224, it's 4222. The eigenvalues are positive. Okay. So we know that that's a local minimum then. For the example we just covered in class now, if you calculate the Hessian matrix at the optimum and find the eigenvalues for it, those eigenvalues are all negative. That's a negative definite matrix, and that confirms that we've maximized our solution. Sorry, for the first example, for the minimization, the minimization example, isn't that Hessian positive? Wouldn't the eigenvalues be the same at every point? So wouldn't the eigenvalues be the same at every point? They would be, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. So but they would also be at the optimum. We're only concerned at, at the optimum. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So calculate the Hessian matrix at the optimum and check its, its eigenvalues. Here in this case, for this example, the eigenvalues at the optimum are minus in both instances. So it's a negative definite matrix. So we know that we've, done, we've got a local maximum. Okay. So what we've essentially done here is got a complete mapping between univariate optimization and multivariate optimization. Anything we can do univariately, a gradient search, a Newton's method, checking the second derivatives we can do in the multivariate case. And we've seen every one of those now. Okay, So that's the end of this theory on unconstrained. We'll begin constrained next time. What I would like you to do though, you notice that this handout has a few extra pages. And it's all about the course project. Okay. There's an important one, um, one important line I have to draw your attention to, and that is your selection of the project topic. Okay, so there it's highlighted up there on the screen. The one task that you have to do is to send a short email to myself and the TAs and explain your problem in that sense over there and that email is due to us by the 9th of March so we can respond and verify that your project is of reasonable complexity there's some other parts here on meetings and the report requirements and then the last uh, two pages contain examples of various problems you could consider as a reasonable project and a table here of prior course projects that have been done in this course to give you some guidance 
You've already, though, looked at this in a prior assignment. I asked you to think about a course project. So that idea is in your head already. This might give you some other ideas to be thinking around.